Thank you everyone for joining me for these live internet studies. My name is Ariel bin Lyman Hana V. These are the live internet studies that are conducted week after week, and there are two segments, like you can see on your screen right now, as I put the kind of the the um the live study show badge in front of you, the graphic that says live internet studies episode number 274 for September 7th, 2024. Segment one is eschatology, a biblical study of end time events. We're in part 72 of that particular study. It is an ongoing study, kind of dealing with end time topics. We're talking about the rapture right now, uh, trying to make a case for a view known as the pre-wrath rapture, the view that I hold to. But ultimately, we're going to work our way towards the book of Revelation. The second segment is uh, segment two is entitled the trinitarian response to biblical unitarianism we're in part 70 of that particular study where we're looking at verses in the bible through the perspectives of two opposing uh christological positions the position i'm taking is the trinitarian position and the position we're um comparing it against is the biblical unitarian which is a non-trinitarian position so stick around for both parts the full hour and a half long study if both of those topics are of interest to you all right so let's do the first uh segment eschatology a biblical study of end time events here is the topical index that i have been working from we're in topic 11 right now making a case for the pre-wrath view which is one of the rapture views so here's the four rapture views. I'm just going to read the descriptions underneath each position. This accurately describes it, in my opinion, so I don't have to prolong the issue. I can jump right into the study after that. The question is asked at the very top of these slides, when will God rapture the church? There are four different views. Reading from top, uh, from left to right and top to bottom, there's first in this uh, uh, chart, there's no particular order, but this first one happens to be the one that's most popular among evangelical Christians. There's the pre-tribulation rapture, otherwise known as pre-trib, and the pre-tribulation rapturists believe the church will be raptured before this final seven-year period known as Daniel's 70th week. Moving to the uh, right side of the screen, upper right, mid-tribulation rapture. Mid-tribulation rapturists believe the rapture will occur exactly halfway through the seven-year period just before the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Lower left corner, post-tribulation rapture. Post-tribulation rapturists believe the rapture will occur dur uh, following the seven-year period known as Daniel's 70th week. So notice it's in direct opposition to the one right above it, the pre-trib and the post-trib are kind of the opposite ends completely. And then the last one on the list, lower right corner, the position that actually I hold to, and I modified this a little bit. You look in the upper right corner of the pre-wrath rapture, you'll see that I added a sign, kind of a second arrow uh, to the one that's pointing down, and I added another arrow that kind of points off to the right above the word second coming. And this, I picked up this um, design from Alan Kirshner, but this position, pre-wrath, is described this way. Pre-wrath rapturists believe the rapture will occur following the opening of the sixth seal of the book of Revelation. The church will experience severe persecution by the Antichrist, but will be snatched away before God begins to pour out his wrath during the day of the Lord. So those are the four positions uh, the four different rapture views that I'm kind of working from um, in this um, study, in this section where we're looking at different rapture views. And I'm trying to make a case for that lower right one, the pre-wrath rapture, where I believe that the Bible gives us enough information that we can um, draw a very strong conclusion. And I've also mentioned in the past, and I'll jump right into it, I've also mentioned in the past that I personally find that a lot of the language of the Bible is compressed enough that if one were to take a lot of scripture at face value and not try to speculate and read into it, one can almost walk away with a post-trib rapture perspective because of the um, nature of the way, uh, say, certain events are described uh, in very overview fashion, it almost gives us the impression, especially when we're talking about um, the parousia of Yeshua, we're, we're looking at um, something that is definitely described in the Bible as a singular, um, a, a singular event with two, or I'm sorry, a singular event with some great importance attached to it, even if those, those important aspects of it 
could be maybe um, uh, individually articulated. Nevertheless, it, we're still talking about one single event known as the coming of Messiah. So having said that, let's look now at where we left off uh, last week. We're talking about a topic that I've labeled disambiguating popular rapture terms. There are at least four terms that I've been working from. Tribulation versus wrath, those are two. And then rapture versus second coming, those are two more. This isn't exhaustive. Um, I could easily bring in several more, but I thought I'd start here because these are the four big terms that get thrown around. And when I'm talking about disambiguating, what I mean in my um, slideshow, as I'm mentioning, is I gave a definition of disambiguate. I'm talking about trying to remove the ambiguity from something or to make unambiguous, right? To give clarity to words. What do we mean by ambiguous? I also have this definition uh, because let's be honest, um, we don't all understand what these fancy words mean. So I put both definitions in my slideshow. Ambiguous is an adjective referring to having more than one possible meaning, doubtful or uncertain. And yet I have to make this disclaimer and I wanna read this again for you real quick. I don't wanna prolong it, but I mentioned this last week cause I don't want people to wrongly understand my approach to Bible study. So here's my disclaimer. It's very short. I'll just read it for you. My disclaimer is that by, and I wrote this by the way, by, dis, by introducing the concept of ambiguity into a discussion on the Bible, I am in no way suggesting that God's word itself is ambiguous in meaning. Rather, often the Bible requires us to composite together details from many different places in order to arrive at a cohesive answer that makes sense of the text and failure to do so creates opportunities for ambiguity to, for the readers. So let me interject. It's not necessarily the Bible that's ambiguous is what I'm trying to say. Rather, the Bible gives us what I'm going to say in the next slide is limited information in certain places. And that causes us, the readers and the students, to be left in a state where without further study, without faith, without reliance on the Holy Spirit, we are subject to jump to conclusions of, of ambiguity. We start drawing inferences and conclusions and we start postulating and um, making presuppositions on certain things with, without having uh, all the benefit all, of all the research. So it would be great if we were perfect in our understanding of the Bible, then we wouldn't have such um, misunderstandings amongst each other. But for now, we have to work with what we've got. The Bible is perfect, but we are imperfect. We're the ones that are deficient. So um, I think that that speaks volumes in terms of how we should treat one another. <laughs> I mean, um, it doesn't really matter if you have a doctor's degree in theology, you're still human. You're still subject to misunderstandings. You're still imperfect and you're still reliant upon the Holy Spirit, just like I am someone who doesn't have a doctor's degree. So I need to um, be respectful of you, but you need to be respectful of me, right? So I continue on my disclaimer. So thus, so-called ambiguity on the part of the text, viz what I have termed information limitation, in my opinion, it often leads to ambiguous speculation and assertions being made by sincere students of the word, both novice and learned alike. And that's what I kind of mentioned is, you know, I study the uh, research of different doctors and different theologians and people who have been studying the word of God all their life. They've gone to seminary and they've gotten um, put into positions like their professor, their professors, their professionals, well, I was going to say their professors, their instructors, their um, you know, uh, they hold uh, very kind of prominent positions uh, in in higher learning and things like that. And they write books and they go on TV and heck, maybe they even make a lot of money. I'm not saying that all of that is worthless, but I am saying that at the end of the day that they have the same text that I do. They have access to the same resources that I do, and they have the potential to misunderstand the Bible the same way that I do, even though I don't have all of those uh, different uh, uh, learning capacities or I haven't gone through all those disciplines that they have, right? I've never gone to seminary. I don't have a master's degree um, or anything like that. But we're both handling the same word of God. And so I can't say that their position is definitely much more accurate than mine, 
but at the same time, I don't want to discount their research. I want to give them credit for the research that they're doing. So I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what they'd say. So in my disclaimer, in light of such challenges, we would do well to tread with caution in an effort to treat God's word with the utmost respect that it deserves. At the same time, we must extend mercy and grace to sincere Bible students with whom we hold differences of opinion. So I think that's self-explanatory, and I hope that this um, goes a long way towards helping us all kind of come together and just realize that really don't be so, what should I say, so um, reliant on a tradition that you've been taught uh, don't just settle in your ways if you've been taught some way of scripture and then your pastor taught it to you this way and you've been learned you've learned that way all your life um, and you're you're just like well there's no way I, uh, that that can be I, I can't be wrong because this is what my my family's been taught this is what my church teaches this is what my denomination teaches and you know all those guys have doctor's degrees and they've been studying this topic forever so there's no way they can be right well, don't be so sure that that has to be the right way. I'm not saying that you have to toss it out, but I'm saying study it out for yourself and at the same time, use that research that has gone before you and try to come to some balance between what you have been taught all your life versus maybe the Spirit of God is showing you some new things, showing you some some things that are uh, maybe were blind spots on the part of other people because of maybe a tradition. So, you know, just just um do what you can, but at the same time be respectful of other people's research. It's it's a it's a balancing act. All right. We left off last week talking about these examples of and I've created these examples of places where in the in my experience of having discussions with people on these topics of eschatology, we've got those four positions that I keep mentioning, right? And we throw around these terms like tribulation and wrath and uh, rapture and second coming and things like that. And I begin noticing as I listen to, to YouTube videos and uh, watch YouTube videos and listen to podcasts and read books, I begin to notice that many times the differing positions are often talking about the same set of scriptures, but they're either A, using their own version of the nomenclature in their own um, position in a way that's different than the other guy's position who's using the same verse, or B, they're interpreting the verse and the, and the language in the verse in a way that's only consistent with their position, but in reality, if you look at the other guy's position who's using the same verse, then you have to admit that if the text were only uh, if the text were completely ambiguous itself, then both positions could be right. In the end, I maintain that the Bible has one intended meaning for nearly every passage, not discounting the fact that there are sometimes multiple interpretations or different levels of interpretation, like near-far prophecy, like now-and-not-yet type realities, where there's a partial fulfillment of one event, and then there's a complete fulfillment or total or final fulfillment of that same prophecy. So we get dual purpose out of some verses where, yes, two different things could happen, and it's only spoken of once, looks like once to us on the page, but from God's vantage point, he knows that it's actually going to be used twice, meaning the prophecy ends up being used twice. So we could have that going on. But it's still, we're talking about even if we look at those two events, even if there's more, more than two, we still have instances of details that the Bible is trying to say that there's one intended meaning. The authors had one intended meaning, and that one intended meaning is the thing that we have to try to get to. But the thing that's kind of stopping us from doing that as humans is that we have our own versions of those words. So here's another example. I, I listed... I think there's seven different examples, not too many, and this isn't exhaustive. I could just go on and on with all these little examples, but this is just for the sake of the words that I'm borrowing right now, the, the rapture versus wrath, the tribulation versus wrath, the rapture versus second coming, things like that. So look at this example. Follow along with me. Pre-rathers will talk about the rapture and the final judgment occurring, quote, on the same day, end quote. Right? I did a whole show with uh, Brother Aaron Eggman's notes about rapture and wrath. Or ha rapture and wrath happen on the same day. And by this, we mean that the rapture 
quote, initiates, end quote, the day of the Lord, but that the rapture and the second coming are separated by the full length of the duration of the day of the Lord, the DOTL, which we figure runs at least five months long. So what would this look like on a slide? Let me just uh, show it to you. Um, this would be, let's go to this slide. So here's a pre-wrath slide. Blow it up for you. This is the pre-wrath rapture. And what you'll notice is that the pre-wrath rapture, when, when looked at all in, in relationship to the seven-year tribulation, the seven-year time frame that people call the seven-year tribulation, but we pre-wrathers avoid that label seven-year tribulation for, for the, the exact reason of ambiguity, because we don't think the full seven years is tribulation. But let's just play with that label. Let's just say it is seven years of tribulation. Within that seven years of tribulation, at the midpoint, something known as the Great Tribulation kicks off. It commences. It begins with Antichrist's persecution of Jews and Christians, first in Jerusalem, or maybe it'll initiate instantly worldwide. Who knows? We don't know what kind of um, uh, logistics, logistics he has in place to be able to implement this thing. But nevertheless, it'll be some type of persecution that Jesus warned us in advance about. So this is something that we need to be wary of as believers if we enter into this time period. What happens is this great tribulation begins running its course. And according to a pre-wrath understanding of this time period, there will be an event that we believe is the rapture slash resurrection slash coming of the Lord, i.e. the parousia. We believe that this is the event that the Bible indicates will cut short the Greek word used by Yeshua there in Matthew chapter 24 that I'm referencing when I say cut short is a, a verb that is used to describe something that has an original length, but then is made shorter than the original length was. In other words, it's the word that we use to describe amputation. So it means, for instance, I'm born with legs that are a certain length. Well, if I get into an accident and I have to amputate my legs, God forbid, well, then my legs become shorter than they originally were. So this is the force of that word, is that there's something that originally was, um, could be longer, or was thought to be longer, or was intended to be longer, but then it is kind of abruptly cut short, almost unexpectedly cut short, amputated by some other uh, factor for some other reason. So we say that it is the rapture event that amputates the Great Tribulation, that otherwise, by intention, the Antichrist wants to uh, occur for the entire length of the seven-year time frame, or at least the three and a half years that he's been allotted, right? He can read scriptures just like I can read scripture. The devil has access to the Bible just like I do. And he already knows that Daniel prophesied that he, that, um, that the little horn would be given 42 months, 70, uh, uh, 1260 days, right? Time, times, and half a time. So that time frame is already given in scripture. And I think the devil knows that scripture can't be broken. And yet he tries to push his um, push his agendas anyway. I, I imagine that when he, initi when he kicks off the Great Tribulation, he wants it to be longer. There seems to be indicative, there seems to be uh, an indication of this in Scripture in Revelation 12, where once Satan is kicked out of heaven by Michael and his angels, he's thrown down to earth and he has great wrath. And John records that one of the reasons why he has this intense wrath it's not just by being kicked out of heaven. It's because he knows he has a short time. And that it's around that same time that John records the 1260 days, uh, 42 months time frame, which is in conjunction with what Daniel already gave us in his prophecies. And so here's the point. This cutting short that Yeshua describes at this point in his narrative in Matthew seems to indicate that Daniel gives us this three and a half years that's given a, a time frame for the devil to do what he wants on planet Earth with the saints of God, namely persecute us, wear us out, kill us, take our lives, etc. But even though the time frame is, remains that three and a half years, the program that's specifically described as Great Tribulation, that part gets amputated. But the time frame for three and a half years does not get amputated. So that way we can harmonize Daniel's prophecies 
with Yeshua's words. Neither one of them lose their power. Both of them retain their full weight and meaning and application of the um, tribulation era is three and a half years long, or we could say the time given for the little horn to wear out the saints is three and a half years long, and yet the great tribulation part of that is cut short. There's another factor that contributes to this understanding that I'm um, putting forth right now, and that's the fact that when we look at who the saints are in the Bible, using both the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, using verbiage from the Old Testament that describes us as holy ones and saints and things like that, and then carrying that forward into the New Testament where we use language such as brethren, elect, um, holy ones, uh, things like that then what we end up with is a composited picture that allows us to come to a definition that the saints slash people of God are um, existing on two levels at the same time. We've got um, natural national Israel, who's covenantally bound to God at a, at a natural level, and yet we have the church or Gentile Christians who are grafted into Israel and covenantally bound to God at a spiritual individual level, but still comprise this universal church. And both of these people groups exist at the same time. And we also know that Satan's going to go after both of these groups, both Jews and Christians. This is uh, also demonstrated in both uh, parts of the Bible, unified. And so the point that's germane for our study right now concerning tribulation is that on the one hand the great tribulation will affect primarily jews and christians worldwide but the part that cuts it short will affect only those who have a relationship with god at the spiritual level rapture and resurrection are reserved for believers in yeshua it is a in messiah event exclusive to those who at that moment are in messiah thus christian in in um in truth Christian in their heart, um, believers in God and Messiah, versus national Israel's relationship with God is at a natural level, and therefore tribulation will likely continue for them past the rapture event, past the resurrection event. So Israel will still need that relationship with Messiah to, to eventually look forward to, meaning at the moment of rapture, I don't believe they have that.